What's up you guys? It's funny how you could minimize a given function through baby steps, or more formally speaking, through recursions. This function could hold a certain meaning, such as maybe you're minimizing a certain loss or a type of risk. For example, in portfolio optimization, you've got assets and you want to find the best subset of those assets that guarantees return with as minimum of a risk as possible. In many cases, it turns out that finding the optimal solution is not as easy as you think. Let me show you what I mean. So say you've got a function f of x that is x squared and you want to compute its minimum. You first start, you know, by computing the derivative and setting that thing to zero. Then you find the minimizer that is the root of this equation. And there you go, you have the minimizer. But what if the function is way more complex? As you can see over here, the derivative is computable, but you cannot find the zero of this nonlinear equation. So you start tweaking around to find the minimizer through experience, and it's not so easy. And that's where numerical methods come into play. Numerical methods are capable of finding a minimum of a certain function, one of which is the gradient descent. That is a very generic optimization algorithm capable of finding optimal solutions to a wide range of problems. The general idea of gradient descent is to tweak around parameters iteratively in order to minimize a certain function. Suppose you are lost in the mountains in a dense fog right? You can only feel the slope of the ground below your feet. A good strategy to get to the bottom of the valley quickly is to go downhill in the direction of the steepest slope, as you can see, whether you start from the right or you start from the left of the valley. This is exactly what gradient descent does. It measures the local gradient of the error function with regards to the parameter vector, which is x in this case. And it goes in the direction of descending gradient. Once the gradient is zero, you have reached a minimum. Now, no matter what the function you have, you're going to have to start by a certain value, right? So in our case, we just picked this initial point of x and then we start improving the estimate of the minimum by taking one baby step at a time, each step attempting to decrease the cost function that you're trying to minimize. So in our case, it's the blue function you see. We started right now from the right of the global minimum, right? And then we iterate until the algorithm converges to a minimum right? That's how gradient descent works in general. Now, as you can see in all four examples, the initial point has converged to a minimum. It happened that in all four cases, it converged to the global minimum, right? This is really function dependent. There's some conditions that we'll talk about now in this video that guarantees conversions to a global minimum, which is what we ideally want and as fast as possible. So let's first talk about the speed of convergence. What happens if you speed up? This speed is actually determined by the learning rate hyperparameter that is eta over here. If the learning rate is too small, then the algorithm will have to go through many iterations, as you can see over here, to converge which will take a lot of time, right? Now, I don't care where you start, <laughs> even though you start really close to the global minimum. I don't care. If the learning rate is too high, you might end up wiggling around, like you get lost. You don't know which gradient to take. That's when you have a large learning rate at the, you will never converge even if you wait till the end of time. <laughs> Not all cost functions look like nice regular balls which promotes or favors conversions to the global minimum or to the only minimum, right? There may be holes, ridges, and even plateaus, or maybe all sorts of irregular terrains, making convergence 
to the global minimum very difficult. So as you can see over here, we started from the left of a local minimum and we ended up, unfortunately, on the local minimum. You might even start on the right of a local minimum and end up at that local minimum. So that's when you hear that initialization is very critical to many cost functions. So it's really where you initialize. So as you saw over here right now, we started from the left and the right of a local minimum. And unfortunately, we ended up on that local minimum. Now, of course, if you start really close to a minimum, you're not going to have the same performance if you start further away from that particular minimum. Now you might be thinking, oh, so what if I start next to a global minimum? Does that guarantee conversions? Well, no. And this is an example over here. We just started next to the global minimum, right? And we ended up locally on a local minimum. Turns out not all functions are really nice to deal with, right? And there's other cases where you start really, really close to a global minimum, but you either end up wiggling around that global minimum or even just in a closed loop. That is, you just retake the same steps over and over again. Now, beneath this noise, with all this wiggling, lies a bit of truth. For a careful choice of the learning rate, you could end up converging locally, which is, you know, better than nothing, right? It's better than just diverging, wiggling around or in a closed loop, right? So we favor sometimes conversions to a stable or a local minimum than just have the point wiggling around, right? So how do we guarantee conversions? Given a function that is differentiable on the R domain, the first condition that we impose on this function is that it is convex. What that means is that for any two points I grab on the function, the line joining those two points is always lower bounded by the function. So let's say we've got those two points. Any line segment joining those two points should always be on top of the function, no matter what those two points are, right? And if you can find one counter example where this is not true, then we stop and we say this function is not convex. The other condition that we impose is that the function is L smooth. What that means is that its gradient is Lipschitz continuous. So in other words, for any two points, you grab an R, you could find a positive number hereby denoted by L such that the norm of the difference of the gradient on those two points is always upper bounded by a factor L multiplied by the norm difference of those two points. What that means is that the gradient, which is Lipschitz continuous, means that you can always find a double cone whose origin can be moved along the graph so that the whole graph always stays outside the double cone, right? So given those two conditions, we've got the following result. And what that says is that at iteration K of gradient descent, the difference between the function evaluated at XK and the optimal value is always upper bounded by the norm of where you started. So this could be seen as the radius square, right? divided by two eta k. So eta is the learning rate and k is the iteration number. So this clearly tells us that as the number of iterations increases, the difference f of xk minus f of the optimal solution gets smaller and smaller. And hence we're converging towards the result on a linear scale, right? And that's it.